<laughs> so it's a, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Michael Blastland, who is a writer, <laughs> uh, radio presenter, was involved in establishing more or less, and uh, also uh, has a recent book uh, called The Hidden Half, which might get mentioned, uh, but, not, but not in a sort of vulgar self promotion sort of way, it might just get mentioned uh, in, in a way. And uh, he's going to talk to us about doubt isn't pleasant, but certainty is absurd. Okay, um, I am realised I do need to keep an eye on the other one just so I know what to say. Uh, yeah. Ah, but um, thanks very much indeed for the invitation, George, and thanks, uh, thanks to so many people here. Uh, I wondered if it'd be three people and my dog, you know. So um, very grateful. Uh, let's just get this last one up. So I'm a. I'm a journalist, as, as George says, and um, uh, sort of background in journalism is interesting because we, we do know about hype. Um, uh, I don't really discover things, I don't really do science, I don't even really do research, but I do spend quite a lot of time trying to test evidence that appears in public domain, you know, and wondering whether it's all it's cracked up to be. Um, and um, so what I really offer, I mean, what I hope I can offer is, is not so much stuff at the kind of technical end. Uh, this is probably a lot of things that you're involved with day to day, but the, the sort of slightly more flouncy characterization of the argument, uh, images, metaphors, ways of understanding um, how we talk about uh, the things that we know through the evidence we have available to us. And um, so I'm going to use journalism as a bit of an example. It's the place I know, but I, you, you can decide for yourselves what, what sort of relevance it has to your own area of work. I certainly think it has some. We do have some epistemological principles in journalism. It may surprise you to know that we have any principles at all, but we do. Um, and um, this is, uh, I'll throw this to work. That can work, clicker. Okay, should work. Okay, so these are, these are really the, the, the principal uh, epistemological principles in journalism. You take a story and you strip out all the complexity if possible, and then you just whack it up, you know, back up volume to 11. And that's the kind of normal, normal way that we have of, um, of, of, of doing things. And um, I was actually taught this when I became a journalist. This is one of the sort of instructional uh, motifs of the whole thing. This is how you do it. And still today, you know, the tabloids, the mail, the Guardian, <laughs> The Times, the BBC. I think it pretty much is the operative principle in, in almost any area of journalism. And I'll try and illustrate that with a couple of examples. Uh, again, you know, interesting to look at the way that journalism hypes and think about the way that research also hypes. Um, so if you, um, uh, if you just take, take one that's in the news a lot, which is the um, air quality, air pollution and so on whole series of stuff in The Guardian. The Times is running a campaign on this, has been a very aggressive campaign about the need for pure air, cleaner air. If you go and get some data about the trends in air quality, um, the numbers are all astonishing. So you sort of take a hundred back when I was a kid. Whoops. Oh, don't touch the screen. Don't touch the screen. <laughs> it's a smart screen. Back when I was a kid in 1970. Um, you know, I mean, air quality was about five times worse when I was a kid. It's an absolutely extraordinary change. You, you, I mean, the data's imperfect, and um, uh, there are temporal and geographical variations within that. So you might want to say, well, how is it by the roadside? Uh, you take particulates, um, PM10s, the larger, larger particulates by the roadside, since about 1990, down around 98% above the moderate threshold. So, you know, just a measure of what's the severe end of the exposure, Massive, you know, and, and that goes for roadside, urban background, kind of almost anything. Now, you will not see any trend data in the coverage of air quality because it complicates the story, really. And the story is that it's bad, and it is, you know, I mean, people die early because of the air pollution that we have. That's true, I think, probably. Um, uh, I think we could certainly do more to improve it. But the historical data, uh, you will not see historical data in the coverage of air quality. I, I think I've seen this chart, which is produced annually by the ONS, once, in all of the kind of whole output that I've seen. Um, try to keep an eye on this. Yeah. 
it's not going to be perfect. I think there's some things wrong with it, but it would have to be so massively wrong you know, not to be relevant to the current debate. But it seems not relevant to the current debate. The interesting thing is, you go to King's College London, which is the source of a lot of the kind of media um, reporting on air quality, and the same emphasis is there. The same neglect of the historical trends. So what, what you get are these stories saying, um, you know, high stroke days, look how many more people die, on, sorry, on high, high pollution days. You'll never get anybody saying, well, <clears throat> how many lives saved does that represent? That's a kind of calculation that just isn't done. And, you know, this is a very simple journalistic narrative, which is that air pollution is a bad thing, it's at bad levels, you know, and anything that's bad. So, in a funny way, we become a kind of confirmation bias machine. This is my character, another characterization of journalism. I can sometimes say this is a journalist again, it doesn't say, this is what you do, you're a confirmation bias machine. So, how they? But, you know, you take this broad narrative, it's bad, and then you go out and seek further evidence of how bad it is. I don't go back to the elementary data and ask the question here. And King's College, I think, um, doesn't seem to me to be very different to the way that journalism behaves. The data is there, the ONS does produce it. Another example, um, obesity. <clears throat> so you take 40% of primary leavers to be overweight within five years, says the Times, this was about a month ago, and uh, they're basing this on Public Health England forecasts, <laughs> um, and so they produce a nice little chart there. Uh, well, the origin of that data is uh, kind of quite interesting. So public health has a series, a historical series, and then it has a set of projections. And it also has upper and lower confidence intervals for those projections. So what does the, um, what does the, uh, the Times do? Well, it just kind of... <laughs> <laughs> takes the upper range and then eliminates any uncertainty around it and declares that that's the, that's the, and then, you know, and then there, there you go, there's the chart. Um, the, the, the first set of data has actually come out, actually, this is, this, although this was written only months ago, the new, um, new data from the National Child Measurement Program has came out a couple of weeks ago, and um, it's actually flat. In that first year of the projected period, it's actually flat, so the, um, the, um, Public Health England predicted a 0.2% rise, percentage point rise, in its um, central, not its inflated, in its central forecast. It's actually 0.2 wrong, you know, it's flat. The Times, which predicted about a 1.2% increase, was wrong by more than the variation in the whole series, um, which we'll see in a minute. Because there's a, so that's the newspaper, you think, well, you know, journalism, that's what you would expect. But I, I just want to have a little look at the kind of these early estimates of the trends in what we've got here is obese and overweight combined the percentages here but the shape of that line is pretty much driven by obesity okay. overweight is kind of relatively constant not changing very much uh, 10 to 11 year old obesity is driven by changes in obesity um, so if we go if we go back to the source material for the public health england data which is the national child measurement program and we um, look at their chart, you can see it looks pretty similar because this is just for obesity. This is just for obesity, so you've got lower percentages, but it's a broadly similar sort of shape, except that the, and again, highlight those early three, three values, Public Health England um, reports it like this. National Child Measurement Programme says this, but for those early years, comparison is not possible as obesity prevalence was an underestimate due to low participation. You go out and you try and measure people who are overweight, who doesn't want to participate in a survey of people who are overweight, you know, <laughs> guess. Uh, so we go to, uh, yeah. Um, and um, there are other things that seems, it looks like there was a lot of rounding up going on in the early years. You know, you can, you can look at the number of values that are on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, um, uh, on a uh, that come in on 10 or 20 or, half or whatever, you know, a full value, and there are too many. You know, you get about 20% of the values are rounded, and which way are they rounding? I wonder, you know, probably rounding up. So you can see that there were a few things going on in the early years of the survey that makes these numbers dodgy. Uh, you can, though, if you dig far enough, you can go back to an old printed version, PDF, wow, back in about 2008, where the, where the uh, NC uh, National Child Measurement Programme 
estimate of what it's all a more dependable value, more realistic value could be for those those numbers. And it said, well, we think probably there. Yeah. You can find these corrections. Not, nobody talks about them anymore, but they are in there way back. Public Health England certainly doesn't. Public Health, Public Health England hardly, hardly mentions the, um, it's pretty hard to find this. It just produces you those runs of historic data, you know, and says this is what's happening or what's happened. Now that kind of changes your sense of the trajectory of the line quite a lot, as endpoints tend to do. Um, so um, you take that and you try and make an adjustment to that roughly, and I think it probably come out something a bit more like that on current evidence. They say, well, it's still very high, and I'd agree. You know, the, the stupidity of all of this is that there really is a problem. You know, and the line probably is tending up, and the proportion who are overweight or obese is becoming more obese. <coughs> you know, it's shifting stuff. There's a real problem here. It's just a real problem isn't quite good enough. You know, it's got to be the apocalypse tomorrow. You know, that kind of. We're all doomed, you know, and, this, and this is kind of completely disproportionate. So I think what, what the public health, public health England has got it in a, got itself into a ridiculous position where responsible and serious people are stuck in this hyperbolic loop that they now can't get out of. They're, they're just nailed to this thing because the PR cost of admitting that you know some of these things have been a little bit inflated in the past. Uh, that we've been exaggerating the likely trends, you know, in future, which they have repeatedly, you know, every time we come out of the forecast, we underperform against it, if you see what I mean. Um, but even the, even the absolute level, so I'll do one more, one more, one more thing on, the, on, on this absolute level, because um, kids' BMI is tricky. Their body shapes are not quite the same as adults. You can't use standard BMI calculations to determine whether they're obese or not. So way back, what we did is we just extrapolated down the age range from those age groups where we thought we could. And we said, okay, whatever it was, 1980 or something, 85, looks like about two and a half percent of the kids are gonna be obese based on what we can measure reliably in older age groups and given the, the age profile of obesity. And then for some reason that I can't quite get to the bottom of, they decided two and a half percent wasn't good enough, so they call it five. So we don't really have a reliable benchmark now we're measuring, we're measuring obesity on the basis of a benchmark, a historical benchmark, which probably wasn't obese. So I suspect, and you can see that actually, you can see that if you take the adult surveys, we don't have as big a survey for adult obesity, but if you take the adult PHE survey and you go down to age 16, and then you look at the supposed obesity for children, in 10 to 11, you were, oh, don't touch the screen. In 10 to, in 10 to, don't even get near the screen. <laughs> really slow. In, 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 in 10 to 11 year olds, you see we've got something over 20% of boys, this is boys on this side. So, now, is that plausible? I kind of struggle to swallow the, the idea that that's a realist. So we don't even know the, true absolute we've got a massive massive survey national child measurement program which gets about well over 90 percent of all the kids in the country and we do not know even reasonably you know it could be half it could be two thirds i you know I, I i just don't want to call it and neither do they so you know this fundamental piece of public data which drives so much policy is Shameful, I think, shameful. And these are authoritative public agencies which are charged with keeping a, a tra track of this kind of thing. Now, I say shameful, is that a stupid thing to say? No, no, that's not. No, no, okay. <laughs> I, think, I, I think it is. Um, I, I, I don't know how we justify it. Uh, so the media, you know, simplify, amplify. Public Health England, can't really see any difference. King's College, I can't really tell much difference between the way the media, the media behave and the way that um, some of these authorities behave. Um, uh, you know, um, is research different? Uh, you, you, you have to tell me about this. You know, you, uh, you sort of shut the limitations in one paragraph and don't let them touch the size of the conclusion, that kind of thing. You know, move seamlessly from association to causation. You know? uh, arbitrary one side of an arbitrary p-value, you know, but it's the difference between chance and meaning as far as we're concerned. You know, this kind of, you know, just push it. 
push it, push it, push it. And we all know in which kind of direction, the direction of a, a finding. Um, what was the William Cayman phrase, George? Mansions of straw. Yeah. Yeah. Not building sturdy houses. So Nobel laureate this year. Uh, he said, we're not building sturdy houses of brick. We're building mansions of straw. And I think, I think it's a very, very nice metaphor. Um, one, more, one more quick example that sits between policy and research, um, which uh, simplifies by suppressing uncertainty. And I'm going to keep coming back to this one because I think you know, uh, suppressing uncertainty is a kind of hype, which is as bad as any other, pretty much. Uh, we'll see, show you a couple of examples. So this, is, um, this was again about a month ago. I don't know if you saw this. Uh, we got the cod stocks wrong. We got them really wrong. We thought they were sufficient. And we said, yeah, go out and fish. Fish cod again, it's all right. And um, it looks as if the estimates that were made in about 2016, three years ago, we thought there was a sufficient minimal level. And it's, it was actually about 20 odd percent below that sufficiently minimum level. It's where it was more, so it was well above. And as a result, you know, we were fishing already unsustainable stocks, and the, the outlook for cod now is bleak in the North Sea. So this is um, uh, this is the stat, one of the statisticians who was um, involved, uh, Robin Cook, who was involved in the MSC, that's the Marine Stewardship Council, making these estimates. Uh, and um, we thought we knew. What we got wrong was our sense of the uncertainty. We were too confident. We believed we knew with too much confidence what those estimates were. And we now begin to appreciate, I think, how poor our measurements could be. And on the back of that, you see a kind of policy decision which could be ruinous. Yeah, absolutely terrible, that, that fish. So I'm, a, I'm trying to offer the comparisons here with journalism, partly to try and shame everyone. Because if you're like journalism, how bad can it be? You know, really. and it's, it's almost a tribute that journalism pays to research, which it says, it's, we don't be like us. And just, just don't do that, because that's, that's it's disgusting, <laughs> this kind of behavior. But we, we begin to appreciate the ways in which it just kind of insidiously creeps into behavior in all sorts of all sorts of respects, I think. Um, so one, one that I use in the book, quick mention, um, to try and um, uh, just to sort of wake up to the kind of uncertainty that can underlie a lot of normal conversation, public, uh, expert, um, uh, about our knowledge of the determining factors within life is, is the Marmocrebs story. How many people are familiar with the Marmocrebs? Probably quite a few in this room. George, certainly. Yeah. Uh, Not so many. Okay. Okay, you've got a baby marmot crab on the left and an adult marmot crab on the right. Um, these are crayfish. Uh, they look a lot like other crayfish, but there is an important difference because when, when, oops, so, uh, yeah, that's it. So, uh, there we go. So, uh, where are the males? You, you, they were, they were, this is in Germany in the 1990s. You get all these aquarium enthusiasts in Germany in the 1990s, and they suddenly notice that they're, they're crayfish, they're lovely, there are no males. You take a lone female, you put it in a tank, it has lays eggs, the, tax, the, the, the eggs hatch mature, you know, they're, they're all females, you put those in, it goes on and on, you know, no males. And they eventually work out that um, these things have become part of the genetic. So uh, they're cloning themselves. And it's probably began with just one, and the eve of the species, unknown eve of the species, suddenly started cloning herself one day. And thereafter, they were all the same as her, so they could do the same thing. You know, so we get this perpetuation of cloned creatures. And they're absolutely prolific, by the way. They, they're kind of escaped into the wild now, and you, they're overrunning Madagascar at the moment, these things. Because you only need one. You, know, you only need one, and then you need millions of them. Um, so uh, the scientists get hold of these things anyway, and they get very excited because um, if you've got, uh, if things are genetically controlled, you can then look at environmental influences as the determining factor in any differences you observe in any of these creatures. Because if it's not genes, it must be environment, right? That's the old thing. If it's not environment, it must be genes. It's got to be one or the other. So they put these things in laboratory-controlled conditions. They give them all feedable to excess. And what do they look like? Well, you get a 20-fold variation in weight in some batches. 
The environment's the same as far as they can control it. The same person examining them on every occasion using the same brand of rubber gloves. I mean, everything they could think of to try and standardize. And yet, you get this massive, they have different um, patterns on the carapace, everyone, unique, identical, uh, well, they're genetically they have, they have these feeding parts of the front of the mouth, these little feeders, you know, they're a bit like teeth. They have different numbers, uh, they have different numbers of teeth. Um, their internal organs can vary slightly. Uh, the life expectancy varies by a factor of three. We're all checked, all disease free. Well, the life expectancy varies by a factor of three. Uh, they lay different numbers of batches at different points in their lives. Their behavior is different. Some of them are gregarious, some of them like crowds, some of them are loners. Uh, some of them are dominant, some of them are subservient. And you say, why? And there is, a, you know, there's, there's this huge portion of uncertainty in our basic conversation about the determinants of the way that people turn out, which is just invisible, I think, certainly to the public. I was telling George earlier, I was at the RSA, I uh, gave a talk at the Royal Society of Arts in London. We had about 300 people. I said, who, who, who's come across this notion before that there's genetics and there's environment and there's this kind of other thing, which explains all this variability? No one. Educated audience, well-informed, never heard of it. Never, what? If you, if you rephrase it slightly, if you say, could there be some chance involved? They say, oh yeah, there could be some chance, but they're meaning, what they mean by chance is difficult. It's, not, it's quite tricky to get there. But they're, they're understanding that genes and environment can be a little bit more complicated than that. It's almost nil. And you think, well, that's true in the public. I mean, George suggested to me at lunchtime it may be true <laughs> in some more authoritative areas as well. You get this massive variation which we can't explain, which we finish up calling chance. But it's, what, I'm, what I'm worried about is the kind of elimination of that from the conversation. This kind of very big stochastic element which we prefer not to talk about. Um, this is Sam Leith reviewing the book, who said, you, like me, probably thought the argument was science was between genes and environment, not between genes and environment, and this other thing. Didn't even know I didn't know that there was this other thing, he says. And I think that is about, that is about where we are on that, on that argument. Um, and you can't blame people, I think, because you get titles like this. <laughs> <laughs> So now I've, I've got a huge respect for Robert Plowman, you know, and I've read his papers down the years, and I, it's, it's, the work is tremendous, but why did he have to call it a blueprint? Uh, and you say, well, is there any acknowledgement of this, this other thing? Well, there is a bit, you know, what we've learned in recent years is that mostly random uncertainty, but well, that's about it. This, li this little footnote, which accounts for a large proportion of human variants, so it's kind of the residual that's commonly called, uh, what is it, non-systematic environment or something like that, NSE. Um, whilst on the other side, of course, you get another blueprint. <laughs> I mean, can we retire blueprint, by the way? You know, you, know blue, you know blueprint's a dodgy metaphor when you see it done for gambling, right? Okay, or for conspiracy theories against Obama. You know, you just, just stop. <laughs> With the blueprint, okay, you know, it's kind of we have high knowledge about an absolutely deterministic system. We don't, we don't, and we know we don't really, you know, as Robert Plowman knows, we don't. But there's still the temptation just to kind of overreach, to over to push that a little bit too hard with a kind of single, single analysis. Um, images and metaphors. I like images and metaphors. So you have a simple problem. You want to stop the cyclists riding too fast on the footpaths. And we know that chicanes do that. So because you see the metal chicane here, you know, you know the way that it works. You have to kind of go around the metal chicane. And so we have a defined problem and we have a defined universe really, and we come up with a solution, we model it, and we say, yes, it slows people down. And we've sussed it. 
<laughs> kind of, you know, because then you start thinking, okay, but we've still separated the cyclists, yeah? Yeah, except that all the people with buggies also go around this, and eventually you've got most, of the, most, of, most people and just walking on the grass instead of walking on the pavement. And so, well, this, this is a way of thinking about the kind of potential oversights, the potential gaps in the security of our knowledge. Now, I've, I find this, this idea quite useful because now you know it's there, it's kind of foreseeable. You think, oh, we should have thought of that. But hindsight, well, we've been kind of running economics on the basis of hindsight, that's <laughs> my understanding of economics, for about the last 60 or 70 years, and well, how's that working out for us? You know, this is, this is the sense that, okay, but we know now. And we're advancing and we're advancing progressively, progressively towards certainty. It's pretty much we'll soon, we'll close off this scope for the random, stochastic, unknown, other half uncertainties. I kind of don't think so. I don't think so. You know, I just find that intuitively very difficult to swallow. I'm happy to be corrected. You know, I'm naive and ignorant about this, but I, I, I simply feel that this is such a good illustration, really, of the potential for things that you just don't anticipate to get in the way of our analysis um, can, can, can screw it up. Um, there's uh, a nice line. This is... Um, uh, oops, sorry. This is from... I'm trying to remember his name now. Um, Uh, James George Fraser, so author of The Golden Bow. He was a, an anthropologist, um, early 20th century, did a lot of stuff on religion. Um, the propensity to excessive simplification, which I think is what we're seeing here. You know, we simplify in order to say that we understand it. Only by abstraction and generalization, which necessarily apply the and I like this, the neglect of a multitude of particulars. And, and this is really what I'm trying to get at with, with that, um, that image, this, this sort of sense of a potential multitude of particulars at the, in, in any individual case. In any individual case, the possibility that it could be confounders, there could be glitches in our method or our analysis. So even if we're not making mistakes, not making obvious mistakes with our research design, there could still be elements which in a particular case are going to frustrate us. I see this, is, I, so I, my interest is, is, is very often in areas of social policy like education. The number of um, Education Endowment Foundation does a good job, I think, of doing randomized experiments. They're, 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 as far as I can tell, they're, they're, they're good, they're strong, they're robust. But they constantly complain they don't work as well in the field as we thought they were given our, random, you know, our evaluation of our randomizations. And then they say, ah, oh, it's because the adherence was weak. People didn't do what they were supposed to do, you know, during the, the, during the rollout. Um, but in truth, you know, there might be particular local reasons why the adherence was re weak, which meant it was almost impossible to adhere strongly to the protocol that was observed in the, in the uh, randomized control trial. I like randomized control trials, but I don't get the idea that I'm, like, I'm sort of hostile to those. It's, it's just that again and again we see how often we do not achieve the sort of standards that we expect on the basis of knowledge that we think is secure. <coughs> um, one last example, because these are the kind of people you ought to be able to. Did David do this yesterday? <laughs> did he talk about unemployment? Yeah, yeah. he did. Yeah. Okay, so we got the three thousand. Three unemployment is three thousand. You stole the slides from who? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 no, uh, I I need the slide, but um, it was neither of us who found the example. <laughs> if that's the case. <laughs> anyway, so you'll know we tell everybody that unemployment is up three thousand, and the confidence interval is plus or minus seventy-seven thousand. Somewhat more uncertain than they let on. The ONS is becoming better about putting warnings on its on its releases now. You know, it's dragged, kicking, and screaming, admitting that these numbers are not reliable. Uh, but it's taking a long time, um, so it does put more prominent warnings. But it doesn't do anything like put a confidence interval, or it's not yet blurring its lines as we've suggested they do a bit. Uh, um, but it's and it applies quite a lot of data like this. So economic growth. 
We have these big arguments at the moment. Is it, is it, was the last quarter of economic growth up more 0.2 mm. or 0.3? Ah. <laughs> or maybe 0.4? Oh, Brexit, thank God for you know. <laughs> and then this is kind of revolves around whatever recent policy is going, going on, you know, because it must be to do with that, yeah? Okay, so how much uncertainty is there around these estimates? Because we don't put any in the releases either. We do talk about the way that they're corrected. Uh, there's some information that says the, the mean absolute correction revision between the first release of the GDP data and the revision three months later when it comes out in the quarterly accounts is about 0.1 to 0.2 percentage points. Now, that's already quite big. Because if we're saying it's 0.2, then an, an, an un, kind of absolutely normal correction would, could mean it's 0.4 or zero. That would be unsurprising. So there's already quite a lot. But they come back to this point about the particular. How big is the variability in any particular quarter? Because the average flattens out the variability. And what you want to know in a position of uncertainty is how much variability is there in this set of data, this quarter's data. So what you want really is a sense of what the variability in that error is. That would be a much better guide to the uncertainty that each of us faces. Well, the ONS is very cagey about this, but it does produce a revisions triangle, so you can calculate it. So here's one quarter, quarter two in 2008. We initially thought the economy contracted by 0.2 percentage points. We revised that down by the usual amount, roughly, and not an unusual amount anyway, and said, okay, the economy was flat. Subsequently, we decided it shrunk by 1.3%, and then we revised it up again by another huge slab, and then up again, and then down a bit more. There's a massive, massive corrections, which are the difference between a titanic boom and a titanic bust. And it appears that we don't know the difference, initially at least. We've got a reasonable idea. We, can, you know, we think this is the best guess, but the uncertainty around it is huge. Um, if you... Um, Take another one, this is quarter one, 2002. We thought it was contraction. This was the, the, the uh, triple dip that never was. You may remember that. We thought on the first revision, we thought it was even worse than that. And we produced a couple more sets of data as time went on, which seemed to confirm to us that we were right. Until progressively over the years, we decided we were in a foot to the floor economic boom of 0.6 in one quarter. 2005 was when we thought boom and bust was over. This is what Gordon Brown was telling us anyway. Remember that um, when he was chancellor? Uh, we had initial growth of 0.4, went up a bit. And again, progressively, this is, this, is, this is absolutely through the roof, explosive rates of growth, which we thought, yeah, fine. I mean, that's heading for a fall because it's unsustainable at that sort of rate. That's, that's, that's almost China. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, you know, as far as we can tell. So, you know, you say, well, the ONS, surely the ONS is going to be kosher about the uncertainty, it's going to be reliable about the uncertainty. No, the ONS doesn't, doesn't really tell us about the uncertainty to the degree which it applies. Um, if you take 2005 alone, at the end of the year of 2005, because some of them is getting revised along the way, we thought that 2005 was about 1.8 total annually. It looks on the latest estimates as if it was closer to five. These are enormous, enormous differences. If you take the last hundred quarters, uh, as I did uh, a year or two ago, and look at the revisions, about 40% of them are 0.4 or more. Now, if you squeeze all that into a short-term mean, you know, because they do, they only tell you about the first three months of revisions. They don't tell you about the revisions that go on and on for years and years and years because we realise we weren't counting the thing properly because the nature of economic growth changes because we suddenly decide to include prostitution, as we did a year ago, right? <laughs> for example, <laughs> amongst, amongst the million and one other things that vary in an economy from one period to the next. And this strikes me as being sort of analogous in the way to the idea that we can we can drive out the uncertainty. Because you look at the conversation about GDP, and you know a lot of people who seem to think if we, if we look at the Baltic dry index, you know, which measures freight, and we get, get real-time traffic indicators from the lorries on the motorways, you know, we'll eventually be able to pin this thing down, and there won't be these kind of errors. 
and I think it's analogous to the Marmot Krebs mistake. The determinants are not that determinant. You know, there's these sort of large areas which we will just not be able to assess because of the nature of innovation in an economy, and the kind of products we make. We don't even know how to value them, some of these things. There are places where you do get the uncertainty. This is the, um, the Bank of England. Bank of England, this is a forecast. So what, what, what people look at here is they look at the uncertainty around the projection. So you have a central band where they think there's a 30% probability. The next layer is another 30%, and the two outside of another 30%. 10% is, we don't know, yeah, wise. <laughs> but if you go back, you see how wide these are around old data. You know, you can see it's kind of big. I will get back. <laughs> There's a big variation, you know, even on historic data, which is two, three, four years old. How long, how are we doing for time? Should I say? No, 20. 20 minutes. Okay, I'll, 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 stop in, I'll stop in a bit. The area, the area where I think um, um, medicine and epidemiology um, where I think uh, this kind of uncertainty and the attempt to avoid it, which is, in my view, a hype, particularly applies, is, um, is this kind of thing. So this appeared in the Lancet. Numbers needed to treat, probably everyone in the room knows that numbers needed to treat were a controversial measure. There's, um, there's a lot that's wrong with them. But the probabilities of the treatment being successful these are the top 10 selling drugs in the United States. The blue is um, successes you get for each number of failed treatments. You can see some of them there. You're looking at about one in 25, one in 20. These are the top 10 selling medicines in the United States. It looks pretty poor. It's, it's probably even worse than that because we don't, know if, we don't know if, say, it works in 4% of people or it works in everybody 4% of the time. We don't have that quality of information. Numbers needed to treat are difficult for all kinds of reasons. There are a lot of people who really don't like them. I don't mind them as one sort of potential source of information, but they are a lot vaguer than they look. Nevertheless, we see that. And we say, if only we could refine our causal understanding until we knew why it was that in one person this disease appeared or to be stopped, and in all these other people it didn't work. You know, that's precision medicine. It just drive this uncertainty out. Well, the analogy there is breast cancer, where you look at the likelihood of having breast cancer in the second breast, if you've already had it in the first, and we observe that even though genetically identical, environmental exposure identical, the chance in the other breast is scarcely raised from that of a stranger who's never had it. And I say, where is our ability then to determine the precise cause why it arose in one breast and not the other, when we have almost complete information, in a way, so far as it's ascertainable? about the background to these two breasts. We don't have anything like complete information for individuals, nor can we. But we hold out this fantasy that we can sort of somehow find a precise causal pathway for every variation in disease and illness. Again, you know, I, do, I just find it very hard to swallow. I'm sure precision and personalized medicine have some benefits. I, you know, we hear about them and I think some of them are real. But the hype, the hype is an attempt to eliminate chance. I don't think we're going to do that somehow. Um, okay. And it's the reason why you know, we can spend an enormous amount of time trying to do this and I think in many areas we're going to fail and the problem is that by that effort we will distract attention from other areas, usually I think at the population level where we can achieve something more. You know, like the go back to the chicanes on the footpath, what you can say is that they will usually work. So you say probabilistically, we do have some evidence here. 
And I think that's my guess is that we're going to get a lot more out of that that kind of route than we are from some of the more grandiose statements about precision medicine. Very briefly, what can we do? Well, we can write books about it. Uh, there are a whole bunch coming up. Um, uh, this this one's on its way in the spring, I think. Um, uh, there's another one coming from Danny Kahneman, uh, which is going to be called something like Noise. This is from an article he wrote about noise for the Harvard Review. You know, uh, so I think he's going to do something about noise. A lot of that is going to be related to decision making. Um, six figure eight bars. <laughs> anyway, uh, there's this guy who wrote something. Anyway. And there's another one. Um, uh, there's another one from David Hand, former president of Royal Statistical Society, coming out next year called Dark Data. Similar kind of idea. Uh, you know, that ignorance is going to be the new clever. Take it from me. Right? This sort of sense of our limitations. And in a way, that's unsurprising given our recent history. If you look at politics, Trump? Corbyn, Macron, you know, where did these people come from? Any analysis of politics would say would have said 10 years ago, all oh, this was impossible. Economics and the 2008 crash, we thought we had it, and suddenly, bang, the thing falls apart. Almost any government <laughs> policy, you know, uh, let's liberate, uh, let's democratize Northern Africa. Yeah, that worked out. Yeah. yeah the, the, the sort of policy failure, the unending round of policy failures that we see where people tell you, this is how it is. We know this. We can confidently predict, blah, blah. We understand the causes. Yeah. On it goes. It's not convincing that kind of level of promise, I think. We, I'm massively impressed by science because it makes small games. <laughs> I think that's incredible. You know, it doesn't have to be up here in order to dignify itself. Uh, because I think that becomes undignified. The costs, uh, these, uh, well, we can, we, what else can we do? Um, we can do, um, we can offer images like that, um, you know, metaphors. Uh, one metaphor I like a lot is just to show people what chance does, you know, because the appearance of meaning. So here we are, the spirit of the Loch Ness Monster above Bob Regis, which I caught one day, you know, this is, this is, it can't be real, no, and it looks like it. It looks like it. Um, Prince playing the guitar. Off Aberdeen. Can you see? Can you see? <laughs> you can't quite. I don't know if you can see the sort of guitar. Is it kind of the hair down the back here? Yeah. Prince spotted playing the guitar in Aberdeen, anyway, um, in the North Sea. Uh, Jesus on Toast was one of the most famous. Because that can't, I must be divine to enter that, must um, After that, you got a whole bunch of sort of um, <laughs> Jesus <laughs> phenomena came uh, which is, and it's slightly tricky because you can actually buy the real Jesus, except that, that makes you think, well, what is the real Jesus on toast? Because the second one maybe isn't, that's artificial. So maybe the first one was real and this isn't real at all. Um, the, uh, the Nun Bun, my, my, my favorite of the, of the lot. Is a, I, can you see this very well? This is, this is a, a, a cinnamon bun that was supposed to resemble the Mother Teresa. And, um, and that, one, uh, that one, apparently, there are loads of those on the internet as well. There are everyday objects that look like celebrities or religious figures. Um, so, you know, I'm inclined to persuade, try and persuade every, I'm going, to, I'm going to go into business actually where I sell these and every researcher sticks them above their notice board to say that it, lo it looks like a finding. It looks like a finding. Right. <laughs> it looks like a finding. Um, so we should, we, should, we should adapt this slightly. We should, um, we should do this, kind of, well, the, kind of look like a, you know. Because we're failing to appreciate the degree to which chance and uncertainty and stochasticism really are, could be affecting the kind of results that we see, um, I think. Um, we can use stories. We use these kind of stories to expose areas of ignorance. I feel ambivalent about stories. Stories are usually used as confirmation. You know, you get the one case, which is supposed to exemplify all cases. They're much better used as falsification. I think, um, I think there's a legitimate use of narratives when they're falsifying a general belief. So that really does create a problem. And it uh, um, can be quite instructive. Um, we can change the way that we think about our causal models. We can begin to appreciate that, you know, the simplicity, uh, 
It's, you know, this is one for politics as much as anybody. You know, there's all those ministers who sit at the desk believing their buttons and levers are connected to the outside world and they're not. <laughs> or rather they're connected to something else other than the thing they think they're connected to. You get all the unintended consequences and the rest. Um, so we could just sort of slightly elaborate our models of, you know, and appreciate that the areas of complexity which might lie outside our imagination even can still be, still be influential. Um, these are some of the ways in which the mousetrap can fail, <laughs> according to Wiki. They are extensive. <laughs> I could never get Did anybody have this as a kid? Did anybody ever get this to work? <laughs> I, could, I could never get it to work. Is it? Apart from an answer, because of the externalities, right? Because, you know, the ball rolls over and knocks down your brother's card game, and then he kicks the whole thing over. Okay? And, you know, it's far too simple, this is, because it's not willful, it doesn't have any agency. You know, it's a, a complete uh, simplifying parody of the real complexity that we actually have to face. Um, uh, why, 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 why does it matter? Um, well, I think we're getting into trouble. Um, you're seeing more and more of this kind of thing, I think. Not a lot at the moment, thank God for Brexit. Keeping you off the front pages is... Um, <laughs> because, you know, as Marcus, I've heard Marcus say one Daily Mail headline away from a real crisis. <laughs> Whether you want to call it a crisis now or not, I think I know is a moot point, but I think not very not very far away and I think it's because we're reaching too far I think a lot of it is because we're reaching too far and then we say oh, you know and you get the controversy and the pulling back and the expectations are disappointed and all this kind of stuff um, I started trying to think about where it could go so this is this is in my fantasy headlines right so I thought what if the times what if they really went for us you know if they really if they really, really went where it hurts after the money. And, uh, you know, the wrong sort of people. It's the old Chinese curse, isn't it? Um, may you come to the attention of important people. You come to the attention of the wrong kind of people, you know, things go very wrong. Uh, and you, I had to do one for the sun. I had to try and think of one for the sun. <laughs> 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 and by then you'll say, but that's unfair! And I'll say, by then it won't matter. Unfair, you know, live by hype, die by hype. Ah, do I know that's going to happen? No, of course I don't, it probably won't. Um, but I think, uh, I think the, risks, the risks are there. Um, I think we, we, we have to watch it and we have to... So what's the... What's the um, uh, what's the alternative? Well, the, 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 we, you know, there's a lot of conversation which I, I admire hugely and I think is terrifically good, particularly in the way that so much of it is self-organized about the replication stuff with open science and pre-registration and um, you know, all these, all these research emphasis on research design and triangulation, trying to get multiple sources of evidence. I think this is terrific. But I think the one, the one other thing that I would encourage is, is the attitudinal humility you know that we need an ethic of humility not because just because our methods um we get things wrong but because even when we get them right you know it's it's still so hard to know that you've accounted for every variable that's going to be influential in a particular circumstance and i think that's the so you know it's sort of have i been modest this afternoon not that much you know i've been a journalist shooting my mouth off but um i think i i, I I feel profoundly ignorant, really, about a lot of these things. And I think, in a way, we all should, uh, because that's, that's the nature, the nature of things. Terrible. Jacob Burkhart was um, an art historian, actually. He's got some pretty dodgy views about democracy and women. Don't, don't expect a kind of perfect. <laughs> but it's a nice phrase that the temptation to become these terrible simplifiers is, is strong in all of us. Uh, um, no, what's his name? Philosopher Ray Tallis. Ray Tallis has a lovely phrase. He says, We're all professors of data lean generalization. You know, those dinner parties where you start telling everyone about the, the, the Russian personality in five words, you know, that kind of thing, or Labour's foreign policy, and you know, and you nail it in a sentence, and you know, these kind of <laughs> over ambitious. Uh, I was going to leave you with that one for terrible simplifiers, but I can't do that. Can <laughs> um, uh, uncertainty, by the way, is not that bad. It really isn't that bad. Um, 
confessing your uncertainty doesn't seem, the Winton Centre has been doing some work on this, doesn't seem that uncertainty does that much damage to your credibility. If anything, it might even enhance it if you admit it and you put some quantification around it. You know, because the fear is if I, we admit our uncertainty, we lose credibility. Don't think there's evidence for that. Not if you do it right. So I just think we should. I think it does need to become a much more powerful ethic within sort of all areas of uh, evidence gathering and understanding. The media will never do it. Um, but I think, as I said earlier on, you know, the tribute that journalism pays to science is that it says, do not be like us. You are different. It matters that you are different. Well, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Ready to take questions? Yeah, yeah, we've got sort of five, six minutes, I think. But yeah, or as long as you like. One of my favorite statistics I look up fairly frequently is the reported circulations of newspapers mm. in the last two decades. It's absolutely incredible what's happened. Yeah. They're essentially disappearing. Yeah. Do you think there's any relation between that process and some of the issues that you've been describing? around mm -hmm. the credibility of the information that they're providing? Um, well, it's often said that people can find their sources of authority much easier than they used to now. So if you're tribally inclined, you can find, you know, instead of having to go to the Times paper record, <laughs> you can dig up any number of um, pundits or other commentators from think tanks who have as much access to you as the medium used to do. And so you can simply go about doing the old confirmation bias thing and reinforce any existing opinions without reference to the, to the countervailing evidence. So, um, I mean, that, and th that's, that's often said. Um, I'm not sure. I don't, I've not looked at that really to find out whether it's true that people are less exposed to opposing opinions. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's a plausible a plausible account but, you know the, the, I, I do feel that the sort of it isn't I can say it no more than that you know this intuition that there were there, there are just more and more chances in the room all getting a hearing uh, all clamoring for attention and playing that game isn't going to work you know becoming another chancer in the room you know I think eventually will rebound people become tired of this and cynical and I, I think seeing a little bit of that around science the expert stuff so that, that, that that's that's the danger um does it relate to declining circulation might relate more to the alternatives but i don't know good answer you don't know i can say i don't know anything and you can't you know with impunity because you can't against me it now. ignorance is my thing I think you're in a really enviable position to be completely independent and to be able to put out your ideas and put across your theory and back to the market. And there's not really a, an agenda as such. Um, I'm referring to something that you know, we all know that influences science today, which is the heavy reliance on metrics yeah. and how central funding mm -hmm. and jobs have been kind of metrics. So I'm wondering, I know you work outside of India, but what your take would be about the tension between the I'm, like the right I'm and enormously the sympathetic to the institutional pressures that we face. I, I, I go along with the argument that there's no point or there's little point sort of battering at individuals, you know, when the systemic pressures are, are huge and the ways in which we can fool ourselves are so many. Um, so you don't have to suppose that there is kind of individual evil operating and you, know, you can just look at the way the incentives are arranged and say is it any surprise um so i think um you know i know marcus talks a lot about this um but we do have to try and work hard at realigning the incentives and how, how how to do that well i think there is a place you know this is why i'm torn about journalistic coverage because a really good way to do that would be a massive amount of shame. Yeah, so talk up the crisis. 
Now, if you want reform, there's nothing quite like a crisis. So, now I, 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 I appreciate the argument that crisis talk can be alienating and it appears to sort of disrespect the efforts of a great many honest people. On the other hand, change sometimes comes from a big kick up the pants. And so I, you know, I thought, shall I write the piece that says, turn off the money? <coughs> Before I'm sort of dropped out of town, and I, and I you know, I, I sort of consciously decided no, I won't write that piece because I think it would the collateral damage would just be too great. Um, but oh gosh, it's difficult, isn't it? How do you how do you give some of the institutions the jolt they really need in order to reform? I don't know. So we've got, we've got a live stream and we've got a question. Okay. As researchers, do you think we should avoid the university uh, press office and doing press releases around our research? Uh, so we've, <laughs> we've, we've looked a little bit at um, what um, David Spiegelhalter calls the research pipeline to see how much of the grot arises at different points. Is it just the media kind of opening the press release? Is it press release? Is it the brief given by the researcher to the media, to the press office? And so, it goes all the way back. It goes all the way back. You know, so press officers, yes, they need to be handled with caution, but that, that, that's because they will believe you if you hype. Because right? they don't have the wherewithal to challenge you. you know, they're not experts in, in, in particular fields. They're just press officers, probably with a journalistic background. They've learned a little bit more as the years go on about particular disciplines, but they're not experts. And if you tell them this is transformative, then they'll write transformative. So don't blame the press office entirely. The press office is a, is a tool or should be. The thing, the thing I worry about with almost all press coverage really is that it's an, an episode of press office, right? Is that the belief in stories, the belief in narratives as a way of selling whatever it is, you know, this, this is, this is how you connect with people, through telling stories and so on. I, uh, can I still do this? Um, just very briefly, because, no, I can't. It doesn't look like it's working. Oh, hang on. Oh, hang on. Can we... Yeah, there we go. Okay, so the problem with narratives is that they are compelling. They're really compelling and they get emotional engagement. So if I tell you a story, this is the following story, you'll recognize this. The family is gathered around the breakfast table, yeah, uh, in Casualty, right? You're watching an edition of Casualty, and the old man coughs. Now, you know that in a world at large, a cough is not statistically significant. It's not significant of any kind. But you're watching Casualty, right? And you know it's a triple heart bypass, don't you? And you're right. You know, how did you know that? Well, because you know the shape of the story, right? You know the, the story archetype. Here's the thing. Once you think you know the shape of the story, you interpret all the evidence differently. You look at a cough and you say, ah, told you. Yeah, and, and you know, so, so the problem with storytelling is that we believe them too. They infect the tellers as well as the hearers. And that's, and that's a huge danger. I think, you know, because we know that they kind of simplify causality and they provide plausible <laughs> connections between things, which may, you know, plausibility, plausibility in narrative. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, plausible narratives, you know, how, how about this for a plausible narrative? I love this. There's a strange kind of plausibility about this. Do you not agree? <laughs> <laughs> so I, so I, I did this. I did this as a, I used to write a column for BBC Online, you know, and I just gave people this question, you know, answer it as imaginatively as you can. And this was online at best. Clearly, the author does not realise that it is easier to swim away from a shark if you are not trying to hold on to an ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so this is the weird thing about narratives is that they have a kind of inherent plausibility, which can be utter bullshit. So one of the things we do with BBC journalists occasionally, I teach there now and then, is just try to get them off the hook of feeling that just because the narrative is plausible, therefore, the argument must be sound. 
And that's that's the risk about narratives. You know, they're being sold everywhere. What you need to do is tell a good story. You know, and this is a lot more complicated and risky than that. A lot more dangerous. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I think we, uh, we're past two o'clock, so we're going to have to well, thank uh, Michael again. He's uh, staying around this afternoon and has uh, meetings with some folk. And uh, uh, Marie is keeping his diary. So, uh, uh, well, thank you again for a fantastic talk.